Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Best Ever You show. Uh, we're here with Milan Kordestani. It is our first time meeting. How are you? I'm so well. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And happy early birthday to you. I'm, I'm <laughs> excited to hear that you are turning, what, 24 next week. That is pretty okay. cool. Now, yes. audience, how many 24-year-olds do you know that have a book? This is really, really, really cool. Um, especially, you know, as a mom of four sons, you know, 20, 22, 24, how old are they? 22, 22, 24, 26, and 28. I just made one of them younger. Sorry. And all um, boys. They're all boys. And they're, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. They're a lot of fun. And they're excited to have you on. I said that you were going to be on. They're like, oh, that's really neat, mom. So um, tell me all about you. I'm holding, I'm just holding up your book. Like I'm all proud of you. Like you're one of my own. So <laughs> a little bit about me. Uh, I'm from the Bay area. Uh, I grew up in Silicon Valley and I also have a big family, um, a little bit of a unique grouping of a family. Um, I joke I've had five different parents uh, because I've, I've had a few divorces in the family. And um, along that journey, not only do I now have several siblings that um, are so much younger than myself, but uh, I've also been an entrepreneur and building startups and going, uh, you know, along the wave of creating startups, hiring people, seeing how that goes and, you know, eventually um, refining these businesses to to have what I believe are really impactful startups in the world that are creating um, positive externalities for the world, like conscious capitalism. And so, you know, I, I basically weave all these stories um, together in, in this book I've just written because, uh, you know, there's so many things I wish I knew when I was younger. And so now with all of these younger siblings, especially, it's a little bit of an ode to um, to them and, you know, telling the story is well, you're younger i can't wait to see what you do when you're in your 40s and 50s and more <laughs> my age it's gonna be really interesting i look i look forward to to seeing all the things that you do and and how your life ahead of you unfolds is pretty neat um so i i'm just gonna start with a book so i read in the book that you i'm just gonna start right off the bat because you and i share a love of hang on Turtles. turtles. <laughs> I, I love turtles. Oh my goodness. Tell me about turtles. Yes. So uh, the first business I ever started was breeding and selling turtles. And uh, it's it started out as me just having a normal childhood fascination with like wanting a reptile uh, and this fascination with ecosystems and the idea that I could build an enclosure and, you know, the turtle goes and it basks in the sun and it goes in the water and you have to feed it and you can kind of automate a whole ecosystem for reptiles. So I fell in love with that and learned how to take care of a turtle through YouTube. Um, and that was kind of the start of the rabbit hole. Like, you know, when you end up going down a YouTube rabbit hole for hours and you're like, well, I didn't actually even know if I was interested in this, this, uh, deeply. But, you know, for me, that was turtles at the time at the age of, you know, 13, 14, 15. And so I started breeding turtles and selling them across um, across the U.S. to aquarium enthusiasts that wanted awesome. albino turtles and so on. And any yeah. special kind of turtle. So okay. they were uh, red eared sliders and specifically they were like albino re uh, red eared sliders, caramel pink red eared sliders. Okay. So it was like a market. Cool. <laughs> and Yes, they they're some people think they're beautiful and they've got these like, you know, red shot pupils. Others think they're a little bit scary and alien looking, but <laughs> yeah, I did, it's funny. And um, I don't know how much you know about turtles, probably a lot. But, you know, I, I we wintered down in South Carolina this year mm -hmm. and close to where we were in Myrtle Beach. There were all these areas on the beach where the, the turtles breed and you, in the protected areas for turtles and things like that. And I <laughs> my husband and I walked all the way down sunset beach to wow. get to the yeah it was a pretty good a pretty good hike to see to see there was nothing there at that time of year oh, no <laughs> yeah no it's okay we found other things it was really a great walk but um yes. yeah no i love turtles so i made my husband do that <laughs> pretty funny. but yes. you know, I, I know your book isn't about turtles but you know it's it's good to get to know you i think i think as as a new author you like for me it's always like people ask me about cookies and i'm sure you're going to be now asked about turtles more than you care to talk about turtles but it's all good you put it in your book and I it's did. there what did um so you you hinted at something and i just want to kind of go there um you know i am also a product of divorces and families and things like that did, yeah. and I, again i don't know you so if, if this isn't right you let me know okay. i'm just meeting you but did that was 
was that, did that, was that chaotic? Was it, you know, disruptive and all that stuff? And did it kind of plant the seeds for everything in this book? Um, I also want to talk to you about college too, because I, I have one son who kind of was like you in college, just kind of like, eh, this isn't what it's all. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, okay. So I'll start with the family one. It, yeah. it, there's definitely a few stories in here that are tied to that. Um, yeah. Stories of, uh, you know, slightly hinting at parent trapping uh, my stepmother and, you know, uh, just just being a young person and especially a young boy and like, you know, especially being raised predominantly by my mother and my sister and, you know, how that made me perceive the conversations in my life as being so important. Like when you see conversations break down and you see discourse break down and a lot, you know, difficulty results from that, uh, you start to recognize how to prevent that and how to, you know, kind of work through those challenges better. And so that's kind of what the, um, what's a lot of the principles of civil discourse are, are actually recognizing challenging conversations as being this opening, you know, of a door to be able to create solutions in your life. And that by embarking on these difficult conversations, we're able to create solutions, um, not just within our family life, but greater as a society and, and create a, like a culture and society that we're really proud of. So um, yes, those stories, those, there's a few stories in there and uh, you know, it's. It is what it is, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, I find that I had to put a lot of these stories in there and I mean, you and I, we share a publisher. So I wonder if we had some of the same pushback at different points in writing, but oh, for me, of one of like them go was deeper. Yeah. go deeper, right. And share, be vulnerable and, you know, uncomfortable opportunity for for readers to connect with you and and you know especially divorce it's so common now um especially in in the u.s so it's uh yeah important to talk about well it's it's interesting to me too when you write a book your family says what what'd you write about me <laughs> did they did you get that like what there was say? definitely a little bit of that <laughs> um you know each of them now has a copy of the book and i don't even know that any of them have gotten that far yet but <laughs> yeah. uh you know i i think I did a good job being yeah. diplomatic in how I shared these stories and, and, you know, telling them with as little bias as I can, which is sure. something I talk a lot about in the book is, you know, learning to recognize your biases and recognize that you can never really be fully unbiased, but yeah. um, there's a lot, a lot that you can do to, to help. And having editors, especially through the publisher yeah. is a good, is a good way to have people give you a, a pushback and say, ah, are you really sure you want that in print forever? Right. Yes. <laughs> Great reminder. <laughs> yeah, I had, a, I had a couple of those as well. It's, it's interesting. Um, what about college? So I'm going to keep getting to know you a little bit and then we'll go into a little bit more about the book and stuff, because I think my uh, audience will will love you on besteveryou.com. And, and here at besteveryou.com, we are very not we're very grassroots, um, very unfunded and things like that. So we, we really rely on our listeners to embrace our authors and our show and share the love kind of thing. So tell me about college. So in, in one of my books, there's a, there, was, there are lots of stories about our kids through college. Some of them has, have master's degrees. One didn't want to go to school. You know, there's, our, our boys are all over the place with that. Yes. So I think for me, it started actually, and, and part of why I talk about the turtles is the story of recognizing that I learned really early on that I was going to self-learn and that life yeah. would be full of the need to constantly gain new skills and, you know, find opportunities and say, all right, I will, I'm not there yet to meet that opportunity, but I will be, and I'll do what I have to do to get there. Cool. And so with that mindset came this kind of frustration, this idea that I was going to go to school for four years, be assigned a lot of work that for me didn't feel tangible to create value in the world. And that was important to me, um, you know, especially because I felt like I was going to have to learn through anything I did, any job I took or uh, whatever project or venture I went on would be a process of learning, especially building a startup. And so that, that notion made me kind of um, not as excited for college. And so once I got there, that was, you know, polite. That was well put. <laughs> <laughs> not, well, I like that. Sorry. Keep going. I <laughs> um, you know, and then once I, I got to school, it was this moment of frustration because what I was hopeful in the school that I picked and I did early decision to the school called Colorado College, um, which was a unique program. And so I kind of I, I sold myself on it. I was like, OK, this school, we take one class at a time for three and a half weeks and then you move on to the next. So you can really go deep into subjects and yeah. and so on. Um, and so 
I, uh, I fell in love with that. And to my, you know, displeasure when I got there, it was this moment of realization that it wasn't just like this oasis of philosophy and creative ideas and, you know, trying to change the world. It was actually a lot of frustration and like sadness where people were depressed and they had these insane student loans that they had to pay off and um, working while being a student at the same time and you know, just trying to like get by. And so, you know, that environment was really sad for me to, to see. And, and I thought, okay, like I, I want to solve this. This is the first problem I want to tackle. And that was, that was the first startup I ever created is this company called Auto. Um, and what yeah. we do is we use AI to help people uh, find the courses and curriculums that exist online for the jobs that are actually available in the market. So you can quickly yeah. upscale and reach to jobs. Um, and yeah. So that's that's one of them, and and, you know. and what is that? What's the is that an app or a website? Sorry, that's uh, it's a web app. So it's auto dot com, a u d o dot com, and so okay. the hope is people could even like pivot careers. You know, if you come and you've been out of the workforce, let's say I was I was excited by the podcast I heard before um, hearing about you know motherhood and how society is not respecting motherhood enough, and especially working moms and. Um, you know, this, this idea, especially that like moms need to take time out of the workforce and then come back usually stronger than ever. But if they're missing that time frame, a lot of times they're penalized for that. And so oh, yeah. the hope is that new certifications and skills that you can take online affordably, you know, quickly can also help mitigate that or help someone kind of pivot their career, even if they come back to the workforce and they're like, well, my last job doesn't exist anymore. Uh, what am I interested in now? And that's, that's really neat. Yeah. Especially with, you know, just to piggyback on, on the Paula Ferris interview, cause that was, that was really fun interviewing her. Um, you know, there's, there's another problem. We'll just let you know it. So I, we kind of covered it in the show, but you know, maybe, you know, you seem like a really good problem solver. Um, <laughs> you know, if you choose to stay home with your children, like, like I did, for example, there's this massive gap in employment. Like right now, if, right. if I needed to go get a job, you know, I have best ever you and I have books and things like that, but somebody might say, well, what did you do? <laughs> you know what I mean? I've got a lot of things. I've done website development, podcasts, everything like that. So I think that language would, you know, people would understand it more. But right. back then, 15 years ago, when I very first started Best Ever You, I was like, oh, maybe I should go get a job. I did this whole resume thing and everything. And, and I actually went out on an interview and people are like, what is this? <laughs> you know, what's a, what's a multimedia da, 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 kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And they just didn't get me at all. I was like, OK, never mind. I'm going to go back home and do my Best Ever You some more and write a little bit more. But some people don't don't have that. They don't have an at-home business. They just have a gap. Right. And um, it can be significant from here to there. Um, so yes. yeah, so it's and, a I mean, conversation and boy, talk about a heated conversation. You get moms, moms together in that type of conversation about at home versus working and boom, it's a storm. I noticed that actually in the, in the yeah. dynamic that she was speaking and, uh, some of the, some of the stories she was mentioning, yeah. it's, you know, I think it comes down to culture and society at the end of the day and like what we value. And so, if we want to create a culture, which I think arguably like we do want to create a culture yeah. where we respect moms and, um, you know, oh, yeah. working mothers, especially like, you know, as well, and not have it be this comparison constantly uh, of like, you know, are you working? Are you not? Or, you know, how are, are we going to analyze those four years that you took out of the workforce, but rather saying, what skills are you bringing to the market today? Can you, can we help package what value you have um, for a job today. And I think arguably most of the time, working moms can do that very well. Yeah. Um, like, and we, with auto, try to get granular with it. Like we start with 18 year olds saying, the only job I've ever had is babysitting kids for, you know, in my free time. And from that, we'll ask you a whole bunch of questions. Well, did you have to prepare meals for that kid? Did you have to make sure they went to bed on time? Did you have to take them to daycare? Did you have to manage inventory of the kids' snacks at the home? To figure out like were there skills that you learned here that could be applicable to other jobs and and help you get matched then and, and better you know um, I love that target that resume yeah I absolutely love that in fact what it, what I was thinking about kind of while you were talking to add to that was um, like my own kids as they're graduating college they're like well I'm applying for these jobs and I really don't have the skills that are listed and I'm worried mom 
I don't have job experience. I don't even have a year of job experience. I have, I've worked at McDonald's and the grocery store and all these things. I'm like, that's real life stuff, kiddo. You showing a work ethic and yes. college itself is a work ethic and all these things. But it sounds like you can translate that for these younger people, maybe just graduating from college is a very useful uh, platform beyond that of uh, LinkedIn. Like has LinkedIn in integrated your, your platform into theirs yet? Not yet. I think that's part of the dream. Uh, oh, yeah. is, you know, LinkedIn finds value in what we do, and maybe there's. I see that. There's Hello, LinkedIn, if you're listening. <clears throat> exactly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that part of what we're trying to do as well is say, okay, you applied to jobs on places like LinkedIn and you didn't land that job. What does the data tell us about why you didn't land that job? Maybe you were lacking one or two skills that we could have filled for, you know, uh, for yeah. we charge $39 on limited access to courses, but if it's like, one skill that you needed to take from a, a meta or Google certification so that you can do SEO. And that's what, you know, someone else who got hired for that job has as a skill that you were missing. That's, that's like helpful, you know, and, and, and that's, that's what's getting, missing from LinkedIn is that getting thing. the computer to think that way too. Like, you know, this is a viable candidate with all these things, but you know, he needs to be, he or she needs to be certified right here. And that's easy. Da, 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 here we go. You know, here's a, here's a quality human being with good care, you know, there's a there's a whole side to it that seems like when you do a resume through LinkedIn, it's like almost like scanning it for certain things and it rejects it. If again, I don't know all the mechanics, you know, no, the you're, you're pretty it, but, <laughs> yeah, and it misses the oh, this is a quality human that we can train and assist and do all those things. So the old days, boy, uh, uh, we used to email our we didn't have email for resumes. We had printed paper resumes that got folded up with a stamp on them and an envelope and a phone call and yeah. <laughs> all these things. <laughs> I mean, I talk about this in my book, this idea that like digital communication is now devoid of nuance. Yeah. And that was really a thing back in the day, right? Like I, I shouldn't say back in the day, but like it's okay. it's back, back in the day, it's back in the day that a candidate that showed up to the employer and pitched themselves would be more likely to land a job than uh -huh. one that didn't or sending your cover letter in a unique way or whatever it was that gave you flair that showed you put a little bit more effort into this application than all the other applications that tells the employer this person should be here that's missing now with this just mass application that exists and i never you know. really even thought too much about it until somebody was taught asked me what we used to do it was like a month ago what did you used to do and i'm i'll be 54 this year and i'm like well here's what we used to do we used to get dressed up in our suit our heels or whatever it is, do our hair, do our makeup, have our paper resumes, and you'd go from place to place and actually drop that thing off and say, hi, how are you? I'm, I'm wondering what would happen if somebody did that these days. It would probably be really interesting. There's yeah, probably like no soliciting. Or <laughs> <laughs> no. Probably. You'd get in trouble. They'd actually reject the application and say that. Email that thing. They don't want anyone that aggressive. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so this is this is a really interesting book for for you know, I'm I'm thumbing through again. Um, I've got some reading to do. I I made it to about here before our interview, like right about there. So I at everybody listening, I asked Milan to come back and um, have a really more in depth conversation about your book. And I think that'd be I think that'd be really wonderful because we've got four minutes left, and it's been really cool to get to know you. Could you tell me um, tell me who you want to read your book? So tell me a little bit more about your book, like who you want to read it, what it's about, you know, all that stuff. The target audience is like, I, I call it like a high school boy, like teenage, mm -hmm. you know, young man who is um, kind of what I think of myself. Like these lessons were lessons and stories I was telling to myself as I as I wrote this and my my younger siblings and this idea that there were so many moments where being thoughtful about my communication could have completely changed, you know, the outcome of some situation I was in for the better and not having known the skills, not having had confidence in my ability to have maintained a civil conversation or, um, you know, understand what productive conversation is and to be solution oriented, that would have been so impactful. And so really it's for that, that brash um, younger self. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Um, if there's, and, and I think we all can use that no matter what age we are, just so you know, I'm looking at his book and it applies to all of us people. Um, it, we all have our moments. What's your yes. favorite chapter in the book? Ooh, my favorite chapter in the book is probably talking about, 
I think it's talking about tone, uh, which Ooh. is yeah, that's chapter that's three. Chapter three, and one oh, of the stories I tell in there is about Mr. Rogers as an example of how we kind of had a great example of someone that could maintain tone and change tone to be really, um, yeah. just again, create positive impact through their through their discourse uh, and to do it over television as well. When he was doing it, it was, you know, a great example. So um, I Captain tell Kangaroo, <laughs> Captain Kangaroo was my generation. Captain King, you had to Google Captain Kangaroo. Yes. Yeah. Too, but Captain Kangaroo was our was our go to guy for that. Pretty and was guy. was he relatable at the time, or like did you totally. did he make you feel heard or as like a young person? Like oh yeah, a- yep, absolutely. Yeah. I used to love stuff like that. Yeah, it's the same kind of thing, like the Mister Rogers. And, in fact, I think they were kind of on sometimes at the same time, um, okay. just on different sections. And I think. I think they all had their own little singing thing, but I think Captain Kangaroo had, you know, they all had characters and all that stuff. It was the same thing, just different. Right. Yeah, different, a little bit different. Um, what else can I ask you about this without having like read? I, I, I love, I, I turned right to listening, of course. I love <laughs> the listening parts of books, like be the active listener. Um, mm. Take us to one other favorite thing about your book before you go. Um, other, other than listening, I just mentioned that. Okay, so I won't mention the listening. Uh, I would go into Seeking Common Ground uh, and Seeking Common Ground, which is chapter eight, is this idea that if you go into most conversations with that mindset that you're out to create common ground with the person that you're talking to, rather than assuming that they are one type of person and you know allowing for uncivil conversation to go on from there and leave frustrated and feel like you, you know didn't make your point or get something across, when you go in with this idea of Seeking Common Ground, uh, in in your conversations, it changes the whole the whole relationship that you have with people, and I think in general allows you to be like a happier person when you're going out in the world trying to create common ground with people versus yeah. you know seeing someone as the other and uh, someone that's adversary. Yeah, that could yeah. like even be true of of like you and me. Let's pre- like pretend we were in a workplace together. You know, it it would be an interesting dynamic, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's like <laughs> we're fifty four and twenty four. It's different, you know. And so it's, yeah. and that is our workforce. We have, we have all sorts of people in our, in our work for all ages, religions, races, all sorts of different people. Yes. And it's, it's kind of cool. So this is much needed. So your book is called, I'm just saying, and I'm going to read the tagline, a guide to maintaining civil discourse in an increasingly divided world. Um, I, it looks to me like you work really hard on this. It looks like a great yeah. book. Um, Chris, everybody at HCI looks like they did a great job with this too. Um, I, I think one of my final questions for you is what made you decide to write a book? You clearly, I'm going to interrupt one second here before you answer that. You clearly have, I have two questions actually. I like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come back, but, um, you clearly have, um, a very entrepreneurial spirit to you, but what made you write a book? Uh, I wrote this book because, I created a venture or I started a startup that was focused on civil discourse, this Mm -hmm. publication. And when doing that, I realized that while I can go out into the world and, you know, try to create civil discourse by amplifying other people's stories, at some point I need to create some statement of what I believe civil discourse looks like, what excellence in civil discourse can look like and the tools that have helped me be able to conduct that in my life. Um, and, And really even in the teams I build or startups I build, just kind of passing that down. So I don't know, something about a book felt like it was a, a stamp in time, you know, that says like, I, this is a declaration of what I believe and, and how I, I think we can, you know, create a better society and world. So they're not easy to do, are they? Writing a book? No, uh, it's, it's, it's it easy. And then you go, mm, yeah, this is a little tricky, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. uh, tell me, tell me about um, the, the dough. Yes. Yeah, that is cool. I founded the Doe in college, and it was, I think, the third venture I'd started. And the idea was, after writing for a while, I'd, I had started writing about the agriculture industry for the Huffington Post um, early on, and when I was in high school. And then, as I started writing for other places, I felt like I was holding back a lot of my most intimate stories and a lot of what I felt would be most interesting, actually, to mm-hmm. share to the world instead of just content for what felt like brand building as an entrepreneur. And so- Or safe, uh, like exactly. safe, safe content, yeah. Right, and 
And likewise, there were so many stories that I wanted my friends and so on to share. And, you know, just stories I wish existed in the world that you would never hear. And so this idea to publish anonymously, like if we could create a place where uh, we were vetting every author and every story that it actually happened to them. Um, and, you know, we build trust from the public in what we're doing. Uh, we could get some of the most amazing stories out into the world and create some really amazing conversations from that. So it was this idea of sparking civil discourse through really jarring narratives from people's lives, from all walks of lives. So That's really uh, cool. We, we did that. We published over a thousand stories and a uh, thousand narratives. And um, yeah, we hope to do lots more soon. <laughs> totally fun. All right. What's your website again? Uh, MilanCordestani.com is yeah. where you can find me or um, the doe, like I was just mentioning, <laughs> is yeah. uh, the doe.com. Yeah. Well, best of luck to you. It's been really fun to get to know you. I hope you'll come back, uh, be part of our magazine, our website over on besteveryou.com. And um, I look forward to, to, just knowing you from this point on, <laughs> it'll be really, really fun to see all the things that you do. Very, very proud of you. It's, that's not easy to do. And uh, it sounds like you got a lot going on and, and, um, and have a lot to say. It, yes. It's, it's interesting. And I like the way that you say things. It's, it's, uh, it's articulate and, and thought through and things like that. Your book is really, really well written. I've enjoyed reading what I've read so far. And as I read more, I hope you come back. So. That means a lot. I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the great question and the compliments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's it's and, fun. And chat more when you when you've gone deeper yeah. into it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you so much for being here. Everybody, thank you so much for listening to the Best Ever You Show. Again, here's his book. Look at that. Look at you. Look at that smile. <laughs> awesome. No, there you go. Yeah, you've got the special. Look at this. He's got the actual like author proof right there. Yes. Um, that's that's a you got to frame that or do something cool with that because that's a one of a kind thing right there. Sign so. it and, and, <laughs> and yeah, you got to keep that. It, it matters. You have the, the shiny, you know, yes. nice raised cover. So yeah, yeah, very cool. All right, take care and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Milan. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Your name's cool. <laughs> all right, we got to go.